through the Bible, and this week is going to be focused on prayer. So, thank you, you're getting that handout now. And I've entitled this sermon, Wisdom is Loving People Well. When we look in Proverbs, it's a lot about wisdom. And the word that's translated wisdom, it's actually skilled wisdom. The, the way that the word is in Hebrew, skilled wisdom. In other words, how to use knowledge well. And in the context of the Bible, using knowledge well is loving people well. That's what Jesus did when he came to this earth. In the Bible, in, in the book of Proverbs, the phrase, the fear of the Lord, is used 14 times. It's used in the Old Testament 26 times. So the majority of times are in the book of Proverbs. The fear of the Lord, in verse 7, is the beginning of, of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. And then in chapter 9, verse 10, the, the scripture reading that Harold read, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. So in verse 7, the, the poetry is an opposite. You know, in Hebrew poetry, are rhyming thoughts versus rhyming sounds. And so sometimes the rhyming thoughts are opposites. Sometimes they're parallel thoughts. So in verse 10, it's a parallel thought. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. When you look at the phrase, the fear of the Lord, I've got a subtitle to the, to the title up there. I describe it as living in the presence of a powerful and loving God. Living in the presence of the powerful and loving God. And you're conscious of that. And I put the word powerful first purposefully. Because... That's usually how people experience God, is his power and recognizing that he's a God that's beyond me, greater than me. I mean, I've got a couple of verses here, and Joseph, he lived in the presence of God. He experienced a couple dreams early on in life. He experienced rejection from his brothers being thrown in a pit. He, they were wanting to kill him. But then, in God's providence, some people came by. They decided to sell him. And he goes down to Egypt. And on his way to Egypt, he is struggling. Never to see his father in his mind. Probably never see his father again. But as he's traveling on this way, he's thinking about his dreams. He's thinking about his life, his father. His father's stories about his father and his grandfather, Abraham, that God had a mission and a plan and that through this family, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And he chose to surrender his life to God and live for the glory of God. And so when he's in Potiphar, sold to Potiphar's house, he is faithful as in, in his service to God and everything becomes blessed. And Potiphar gives him more and more responsibility until everything in his house is under Joseph. Except Potiphar's wife. And Potiphar's wife tried to influence him to come and lay with him. She lay with him. And, and it wasn't just once. It was repeated. And Joseph continued to resist. And the one time that it's recorded in Scripture 
Joseph responds, There is no one greater in this house than I, nor has Potiphar kept back anything from me but you, because you are his wife. How can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? He lived with the consciousness God was with him. God was overseeing everything. God was watching him. He was in the presence of God. And so that led him to have this, this fear and respect and reverence of the God that kept him from sinning. Now, a couple other verses where the power of God leading people to be afraid, and out of that, that kind of afraid, serving God. 1 Samuel eleven seven. 7, Saul has become king. He hasn't done anything yet. He's kind of still in the background. But then something happens where a group of people come and threaten and lay siege around one of the cities that belongs to Israel. And they send a message to Saul for help. The people who were trying to lay siege, they asked for them to surrender. And the people inside said, give us seven days, we'll see if we get any help. That the threat was, we will gouge out your eye, your right eye. So they sent the message out. And Saul, his Holy Spirit came upon him and he, he went into action. He took a yoke of oxen and cut them in pieces and sent them throughout all the territory of Israel by the hands of messengers saying, whoever does not go out with Saul and Samuel to battle, so it shall be done to his oxen. And the fear of the Lord fell on the people and they came out with one consent. Saul used threat, fear, to get them to be motivated. And they responded. Saul was now king under God. And so if they didn't, they knew something bad would happen. So they responded. Mark 4. Jesus was teaching all day long. And he was very tired. They get into a boat to cross the Sea of Galilee. Verse 38. He was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we're perishing? Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. But he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? They were afraid, and their understanding of God was limited. And so when the storm comes, they're very afraid, and they question Jesus. Don't you care that we're perishing? They doubt Jesus' love and power. Jesus says, why were you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? When we have a confident faith in who God is, we understand his power and his love. We will trust. And it says, after Jesus asked this question, and they feared exceedingly. There's no storm going on. The danger's over. Now their fear changes into a, an Ah, oh, who is this guy? Even the winds and sea obey him. So they're catching a vision of his power. Still don't have an understanding of how much love God and Jesus has. They're still thinking of power. In fact, that's what the Messiah is going to do, is overthrow Rome by power. Acts 
after Jesus dies and is resurrected and goes back to heaven. Then the disciples begin to comprehend the love of God. It took the writings of Paul. John's writing 90 A.D. about 60 years after Jesus was on this earth. And some verses that express the kind of love that God has. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that through the world they might be saved. And Paul wrote, when we were still without strength, Christ died for the ungodly. God demonstrates his own love toward us while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Paul beginning to explain the love of God. 1 John 3, 1. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us that we should be called the children of God. 1 John 3, 16. By this we know, we know love because he laid down his life for us. And then... I'm going to drop down to 1 John 4, 17 and 19. You're 19. Love has been perfected among us in this. That we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. As we begin to understand the power and the love of God, there is a confident trust and a reverential awe at who he is what he's like, what he can do. And in the judgment, standing before God without fear. Because as he is, his righteousness, we are because his righteousness is given to us. I find it interesting that Jesus was described in Isaiah 11 this way. In verse 2, the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge, and the spirit of the fear of the Lord. His delight is in the fear of the Lord. Jesus delighted in the fear of the Lord. So he delighted that his father was present with him. He said, I can of myself do nothing. As the Father speaks, that's what I speak. He experienced this living in the presence of a powerful and loving God. And so in the context of that relationship, he had the wisdom to love people well. I'd like to have you, uh, Phil, go forward in the slideshow right towards the end. There's a little video of something that's uh, an interesting little story that was broadcast on a news station from Louisiana. And the, the story speaks of itself, love being shared. Let's go ahead and play the story now. That saying, right place, right time, certainly holds true for Matt and Kelvin. These guys met for the first time in March on Good Friday for what turned out to be an answered prayer to make a difference. And right after he shoots a T-Rex. This may be one of the best days ever for Kelvin Ellis. On the T-Rex. The nine-year-old on his first hunting trip for dinosaurs, you can see he is all in. This virtual experience made possible by Matthew Busbus after the two had quite an enlightening encounter a few weeks earlier. It was an early morning wake-up call in March. The day started 
in a panic. The fire alarm went off at the building where Matt lives. So I like threw on some like short little hunting boots and shorts and whatever I had handy. Turned out to be nothing. So I was like, oh, coast is clear. Time to go get my coffee. I might as well start my day. His favorite spot right across the street. Security video from inside shows Matt walk in wearing a backwards ball cap, place his order, then wait. Kelvin just steps away right next door at the eye care office. He's waiting too. We hurry out the house so he can get his glasses and do what he needs to do and leave. His dad there so, for an eye appointment. I was like, oh, I'm going to go hide outside of this coffee house and go pray while I'm waiting on my coffee. On security video, you see a customer leave. Then Matt comes out on the patio looking for somewhere quiet for his devotional time. He finds a corner spot. You see him, the top left. I was just looking around and then I see this back way. I wanted to know where it was. About that same time, security video shows Kelvin enter the patio. That's him in the gray sweats. I saw chairs and I, and I turned to my left and I see Matt in a cor corner praying. You know? Keep in mind, these two had never met. Still, as you can see on video, Kelvin was willing to take the risk and walk right up to this stranger. I'm sitting there slowly opening my eyes, and I see a kid that's about my height coming at me, and he's got gray sweatpants on, gray sweatshirt, and his hands got the big old rings on it, and his hands coming at me, and I open more, and there's a dollar bill coming at me, and I go, what? Who? What? And I, I, I was dumbfounded. I said, excuse me, sir, are you homeless? Because if you are, here's a dollar. I said, no, I'm, I'm actually not homeless. I actually live across the street in this condo apartment thing. And then he was confused. He didn't really know what to do. He ain't take, he ain't take the dollar, though. It's like, it's, I'm not mad about it. In fact, Matt offered to buy Kelvin breakfast. The video shows Kelvin walk away while Matt stays put, waiting for his new young hero to return. Kelvin had to get the okay from his dad. You see him return, and then the two head inside for that meal. I think it was a biscuit. It, it, a biscuit, a sunny side up egg, and some cheese. And a coffee for his dad. Kelvin says he has always wanted to help a homeless person, but never had money. So this time, with a buck in his pocket, when he saw someone he thought needed help, he was all in to make a difference. I had money. It wasn't that much, but it, it could still help him get something. Video shows them at the table, chatting about sports, first love, even heartbreak. Hi, Kennedy, if you're watching this, your boyfriend's on live TV. What, ex-boyfriend? <laughs> WBRZ arranged their second meetup, and I shared the surprising news with Kelvin. The man he thought was homeless I'm not is actually a multimillionaire. Well, you're on Google? Like, you're that famous? I'm on Google. I would say I'm not that famous, though. <laughs> Matt gained success in the hunting industry after launching several outdoor companies and brands with his family, including a popular TV show. Is this your first millionaire that you've met? First millionaire. If you're my first millionaire I met, you can lend me a couple bu bucks, right? <laughs> right? I, I think I think you're. I think I can lend you more than a couple bucks. I even brought you a little gift today, which included some very nice fashion swag. Like this. Back at Matt's store, another amazing surprise. Go. A. 40-second shopping spree, nothing off limits. Time's up. Where are your jackets at like this? That's what I was looking for. Oh, man, you did good. Let's see, what, let's see the swag. Check out the biggest haul. This is not one of those big box bikes. Did you really pick out this bike? Yes. Do you know how much this cost? $1,000? $2,000. And yes, Kelvin got to take it all home free. Matt says it is the least he can do for a kid 
who gave him something that money cannot buy. You gave the only money in your pocket to me and thinking I was a homeless man. And that, that shows, that speaks volumes of your character and what this generation that's coming up, could, if they're more like Kelvin and they're gonna give, they're gonna be filled with joy, they're gonna be happy, they're gonna change the community, then change the parish, then change the state, and they can change the world. You have that power, you can do it. Kelvin says he intends to do that, in fact. And if you know someone making a difference in our community, send me their name, information, and a brief summary to Sylvia at WBRZ.com. In another little write-up, Matt said, he gave me something money cannot buy. Hope for humanity. That there was hope. Now, of course, Jesus is the one who brings the real hope. And that little story. One dollar. That's all he had. But it spoke volumes to Matt. Jesus saw two mites put in the treasury. She gave more than all the rest. And so we have our lives. And out of a love and reverence to God, living in the presence of God, always, saying, God, use me for your glory. In the book Steps to Christ, there's several things that mention. I've underlined some of them. Nature and revelation alike testify of God's Love, And I'm not going to read them all. But one of those part of nature is the gift that God created flowers. He didn't have to create them. But you think of the beauty that that brings to our, our lives, our homes. I appreciate the flowers that Joan plants in front of our house and the beauty it brings and so we've got some flowers here, and we're going to create an opportunity for you to take a flower and bless someone else with it. Usually it's in relationship to mothers, but there are many ladies here who are not mothers or people who don't have children here in this presence. And if you want to take a flower and share your love with someone. I'd like to invite you to come up and do so. And if you have someone that you want to, to express to a man how much you appreciate, feel free to give one to a man too. So this is a time that we're going to invite you to come up and take the flowers and we're going to, I'll help Eldon. So at this time, if you'd like to take a rose and give a gift of love straight from heaven to them.
thank you for being messengers of love this morning. And may that love continue to spread. I'd like to invite us to sing our closing hymn, When There's Love at Home. And could someone look up in the bulletin and tell me the number? 652. Thank you. Let's stand together as we sing. Father in heaven, from your heart to ours, you send your